change it? No, no that's wrong. <laughs> change is bad. I think they're right. Yeah. <laughs> Telecom lawyer is a little out of here. Telecom <laughs> lawyer is, is a different lane than what you're occupying it, now, it, right? It, it, it's Keep it. It's like two lanes ago. Keep it. Yeah. Right. At least two lanes ago. <laughs> but change is hard. Change is hard. All right. Let's start. I think we'll get started. Welcome to Washington Legal Foundation. My name is Glenn Lamby. I am Chief Counsel of the Foundation's Legal Studies Division. For those of you not familiar with the Foundation, we are in our 41st year of free enterprise advocacy and education. We conduct it through programs such as this, as well as through litigation in the federal and state courts, both original litigation and filing of amicus briefs. We're also very active in filing regulatory comments and requests for rulemaking. And the division that I run is the publishing side, think tank of sorts, that publishes in a wide range of formats on a pretty wide range of issues that affect the free enterprise system. In this space, we've been increasingly active over the years. One of our big issues is First Amendment. So when we were uh, commenting on issues like net neutrality, uh, we focused a lot on, on the speech aspects of, of that and uh, we continue to be interested in developments in both the FTC and the FCC in privacy, uh, commenting and publishing frequently in those areas, and, and uh, some of that will be discussed today. I'm gonna introduce our moderator, uh, Kathleen Abernathy, who we very much appreciate being here and all the hard work that she put in to prepare for being a very active moderator, something I probably would not have been able to do as, as someone who's a generalist. Uh, she is special counsel to Wilkinson Barker Nauer in the firm's Washington, D.C. office. She was nominated to serve as commissioner at the FCC by President George W. Bush and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in April 2001. She served until December 2005. Prior to rejoining the firm, she was the chief legal officer and executive vice president of Frontier Communications, a position she held from 2010 to 2017. More information up there on the slide for those of you online about her, and I will pass it on to Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenn, for this opportunity and for that kind introduction. Um, it's really terrific to be able to participate today and support the good work of the Washington Legal Foundation because they promote the principles of, to defend and promote the principles of freedom and justice, and how can you not like that? So I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, it's a, great to have both Commissioner Brendan Carr from the FCC as well as Commissioner Noah Phillips from the FTC, Federal Communications Commission, Federal Trade Commission. So I thought I'll do a quick introduction of uh, Commissioner Carr. He'll say a few comments, and then we'll go to uh, Commissioner Phillips from there. So Commissioner Carr was confirmed in August of 2017. It seems like a lot longer than that. <laughs> uh, he hit the ground running. He has more than a full year under his belt. He brought to the job a wealth of experience from both the public and the private sector and the legal sector. And prior to being confirmed as a commissioner, he was the general counsel at the FCC and served in various other capacities at the FCC. And after graduating magna cum laude from Catholic University, my alma mater, uh, he then served as a law clerk to Judge Shedd in the Fourth Circuit went on to private practice in the law firm of Wiley Ryan, has terrific credentials. Most recently, he's dedicated his significant passion and energy to and intellect to championing the 5G race and from a recent speech, quote, ensuring all Americans, no matter where they live, have a fair shot at fast, affordable broadband. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for uh, the introduction, and thank you to the Washington Legal Foundation for hosting us. And one of my former lives that you alluded to in private practice, I did some work uh, with Washington Legal Foundation, so it's great uh, to be here. And Commissioner Abernathy, in particular, um, I actually got my first start at the FCC in 2002, 2003, mm -hmm. as an intern for Commissioner Abernathy. Uh, in the same office suite that now uh, I have the privilege of being in I at the commission. So, yeah, so it's a real treat. And Commissioner Abernathy also was the commencement speaker uh, for my law school graduation. I remember this very clearly. <laughs> One line from the commencement <laughs> speech, which was this. She said, none of you are going to remember a thing from this commencement speech. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, that is one line that I will remember forever <laughs> in the commencement speech. I don't really remember the rest of it, though. Exactly. <laughs> uh, 
Commissioner Fur Scott Roth, good to see you as well. Um, looking forward to the event. Happy to have your questions as we go through it. Okay. More broadly, I think we're really at an exciting point in time when it comes to broadband in the country. And that's for a couple reasons. One, from the regulatory perspective, we're getting the government out of the way. We're updating and modernizing our approach to broadband, and we're already seeing that delivering tremendous results. But there's also something else that's happening right now from a technology perspective. When you marry the regulatory reforms we're doing with some interesting new developments on the technology front, I think there's reason to have a lot of hope uh, and really expectation about where we're going to be in the very near future in the country. On the one hand, on the wireless, we have 5G, which is this next generation of wireless technology. Uh, it really uh, promises to uh, operate across a number of different silos. One is purely better, cheaper, faster broadband, more competition. Right now, you might have one option, two options, no options for truly high-speed internet. And 5G wirelessly can deliver you your first or your second option for broadband. But it's also going to enable innovations across a number of other areas. A lot of the cutting edge technology that you hear about today, whether it's connected cars, the Internet of Things, machine to machine communication, none of that will work or it won't work well without this upgrade to 5G. Uh, for instance, when you look at the healthcare side, how do we get all of these new mobile health applications up and running and online? Well, right now there's a limit in the system. 4G can sustain about 2,000 devices over a kilometer. Uh, so we can't take to scale a lot of this IoT and machine-to-machine -machine devices. 5G will enable us to do about a million devices over that same space. So that's one example of how 5G is needed to go to scale. And then there's other technologies. We have obviously a new generation of satellite broadband that is coming online that the FCC is looking to approve. There's new fixed wireless deployments, and we've recently opened up funding uh, for wireline deployments in some of the hardest to serve parts of the country. So I think you step back more broadly, you look at the regulatory reforms that we're engaging in at the FCC and the technologies that are coming over the horizon. I think the intersection of those two is gonna be a game changer uh, for many, many consumers going forward. And I think, again, the key is to move the government out of the way. When you think back to the net neutrality debate, for instance, one of the premises underlying that debate, articulated or unarticulated, was this concept of dumb pipes, dumb broadband pipes, and smart devices. And think about where we are now. We're starting to see that flip. For 5G in particular, the networks are getting smarter. The intelligence is actually moving off of devices and into the network. We're seeing cheaper devices whether it's IoT, potentially smartphones going forward, because of the power in the network, you can now move that to what's called edge computing, which is just one example of where allowing innovation in the network, not a straitjacket regulatory approach, has facilitated this shift where we're seeing smarter networks, more investment, more deployment. And at the same time, consumers are fully protected. We have the Federal Trade Commission that's there that can step in if there are violations of FTC law with a particular focus on consumer harm. And the FTC, as we'll probably hear, is the nation's premier expert agency in identifying and acting in cases of consumer harm. And they're finally, after a two-year delay, the cop back on the beat when it comes to the whole broadband ecosystem. So whether it's concerns about privacy on the one hand uh, or conduct with respect to network management on the other, the Federal Trade Commission now has their expertise to bring to bear to make sure whether it's your broadband provider, an edge provider, we have the right regulatory approach to take action if there's consumer harm. So I think when you look at all of this, the future is going to be very bright for consumers and we're going to continue to get more broadband deployed because of the regulatory reforms we've put in place. So, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. And now to Commissioner Noah Phillips. He's a longtime commissioner, uh, confirmed on April 26th <laughs> of this year. Commissioner Phillips came to the position with a wealth of experience 
after graduating from one of those West Coast law schools, Stanford. Uh, and he began, he, his career has both banking background experience and then private practice as a litigator at Cravath Swain and then at Steptoe and Johnson. And then he was lured to the public sector. And uh, prior to joining the FTC, he served in Congress as an advisor to Senator Cornyn on um, legal policy matters such as antitrust, constitutional law, consumer privacy, intellectual property, and looking at all of these very big issues, privacy, big data, mergers, IP, just a lot uh, of wealth of experience that Commissioner Phillips is bringing to the table. And in a recent remarks discussing the FTC's upcoming six hearings on competition and consumer protection, and remember that's the basis of what they do there, in the 21st century, he discussed how these hearings are designed to help target the commission's enforcement and policy efforts for years to come so that you're leveraging the strength of this agency to deliver uh, protections to consumers. So with that, welcome to Commissioner Phillips. Thank you, Kathleen, for that very kind introduction. I'm really delighted to be here with everyone. Uh, and in particular with Commissioner Carr. Uh, I also want to thank the Washington Legal Foundation for hosting us today. Um, your work in support of free markets and accountable government uh, and the rule of law helps keep America competitive and folks like us on the straight and narrow. <laughs> um, I want to talk for a minute about where we are because it's particularly apropos for me. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, this is the house once occupied by Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who was the eldest daughter of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, we think of him in a number of ways, uh, but most importantly for purposes of what I do, uh, he's probably America's most famous trust buster. Um, Alice lived here from 1925 to 1980 uh, when she died, tragically. Uh, President Roosevelt was an advocate for a strong federal antitrust agency, uh, which ultimately became the Federal Trade Commission, where I work. But he also recognized the importance of private enterprise to the American economy. In his 1905 State of the Union, in words that still ring true today, he said, we should recognize in cordial and ample fashion the immense good affected by corporate agencies in a country such as ours, and the wealth of intellect, energy, and fidelity devoted to their service, and therefore normally to the service of the public by their officers and directors. The corporation has come to stay just as the trade union has come to stay. Each can do and has done great good. Each should be favored so long as it does good. But each should be sharply checked where it acts against law and justice. Ten years later, President Wilson signed the Federal Trade Commission Act into law. And just over a century later, um, now is a very exciting time at the FTC. Uh, as Commissioner Abernathy mentioned, uh, uh, I came in with three new commissioners uh, in early May. Um, and yesterday, Christine Wilson, my newest colleague, was sworn in. Uh, I was really honored to be there with her for that. This is the first time since 1915 that the agency has five new commissioners at the same time. Uh, and while all of us are new in a certain sense uh, to the role and some of us new to the agency, um, the agency has a whole has a really strong tradition of involvement in a variety of issues, uh, including uh, broadband, which we're discussing today. The FTC first waded into these waters in 2006 with the formation of the Internet Access Task Force, and in 2007 held a workshop that brought together stakeholders to explore competition and consumer protection issues related to broadband Internet access. The resulting report on broadband, broadband connectivity competition policy identified principles that continue to frame a useful analysis. In particular, as the report concluded, quote, in evaluating whether new proscriptions are necessary, we advise proceeding with caution before enacting broad ex-ante restrictions in an unsettled dynamic environment, end quote. So fast forward to the present, 11 years later. We've brought numerous cases relating to broadband access and consumers' use of the internet. Take two recent throttling cases. Uh, in 2015, we settled charges uh, that TrackPhone, a large prepaid uh, wireless provider, 
failed to disclose that it throttled the speeds of consumers on, quote, unlimited data plans. The company paid $40 million in consumer refunds. And we are currently in litigation against AT&T Mobility, uh, in which we allege that the company unfairly throttled the speeds of consumers on plans advertised as, quote, unlimited. The complaint also alleges that AT&T failed to disclose this practice. Under the recently modified uh, transparency rule, broadband ISPs now must disclose on the web certain network management practices, commercial terms, and performance characteristics, identifying if they occur practices like throttling, blocking, and prioritization. The FCC will ensure that the companies make the disclosures, and we will investigate whether the companies do what they say. And if they are not, we will bring enforcement actions. As Commissioner Carr mentioned, the rollout of 5G will accelerate trends of interconnection, data collection, and use. This will benefit consumers, but it will also raise continu continued and increasing privacy and data security concerns. This requires us, the FTC, to continue to be an active law enforcer in the broadband space. In addition to enforcement work, uh, the Commission is also continuing its policy work. Two weeks ago, uh, we began a series of public hearings hosted by the FTC at locations around the country. It's going to be, by the way, a lot more than six. Hmm. Oh, boy. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> it is uh, consistent with what Chairman Potofsky uh, initiated in 1995, a very broad undertaking, looking at a lot of very important issues, um, uh, including uh, broadband. Um, so uh, pay attention. You know, uh, it's available online uh, if you happen to miss the hearings. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of commentary uh, going on in which everyone can participate. I hope that these hearings uh, enable us to consider, over a decade later, issues and evidence relating to broadband access uh, that will continue to inform our understanding and our enforcement in the broadband space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. So now we'll go into the Q&A, which is the most fun part of this anyway. Um, and as both of you were talking about broadband and where we're headed with broadband, I was reminded that back in the early 2000s, and certainly Commissioner Fritchcott Roth and myself, when you looked at the internet, and I'm not even sure broadband was, was really coined yet as a phrase, it was considered this nascent technology. We didn't really know what it would look like or what it would feel like or if it would even work or would the investments be made. And so government stepped back and said, light touch, let's see what happens, let's see where this goes. We now know it has tremendous impact on everyone's life, uh, jobs, investment, uh, education. It addresses so many pieces of our economy and, and our quality of life and also presents challenges. So now the tension, one of the tensions, is a federal framework. You know, the states look at it and say, well, this is pretty important stuff. I think I want to regulate it. Uh, but historically, this has always been regarded as, as interstate in nature, requiring a uniform structure across all the states in order to unleash the benefits of it and also to police it. So I thought I'd have both of you talk a little bit about the federal framework versus the state framework and the impact on consumers uh, of one versus the other without prejudging. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think you're right. I mean, the internet broadband has become fundamental to the lives of communities, businesses, families, and people are passionate about that. They're passionate about the free and open internet. And rightly so, no one wants to be blocked. No one wants to be throttled. And we do have a framework in place now uh, that doesn't simply rely on competition and marketplace forces. I think those are strong checks. But the approach that we have uh, is not one that gives providers a blank check to engage in a lot of this conduct that consumers care so much about. Uh, we heard from Commissioner Phillips, for instance, about two of the throttling cases uh, that they've brought in the F. CC has been partnering with and working in conjunction with the FTC on those issues. You take the AT&T throttling case, for instance. Uh, when I was general counsel, we filed a couple letters in that Ninth Circuit case supporting the FTC's position in that case. Uh, that position ultimately prevailed 
uh, in an en banc decision in the Ninth Circuit uh, to make sure that there isn't a, uh, in the words of that particular case, a regulatory gap over the conduct at issue there. And, and can you just, for a minute, this regulatory gap thing is bizarre for people who don't live and breathe what we do. Yeah. Right? So, so you're good. So right. So generally, there's a, a, a break between the Federal Trade Commission's authority and the FCC's the authority. Uh, one of the lines that you see that is with respect to regulation of common carriers. Uh, so prior to the FCC's uh, Title II decision a few years ago, broadband was classified under the Communications Act as a Title I information service, not as a common carrier. And what that meant was both the FCC and the FTC had authority to act uh, with respect to broadband providers. Uh, when the FCC reclassified broadband for the first time as a Title II common carrier service, that stripped the Federal Trade Commission of 100% of its authority to protect consumers to take action against broadband providers. So by our decision to restore the 20-year Title I regulatory framework for internet regulation, it restored the authority of the Federal Trade Commission. We have an MOU in place. We have a transparency rule that we've adopted that applies to broadband providers that the FTC uh, has enforcement authority over. So we're back to a situation where we're working together to make sure consumers are protected. And your point about federal versus state, uh, that's something that's really been long decided, uh, Democrat, Republican administration alike at the FCC. In the 2015 uh, Obama era Title II decision, for instance, they were very clear uh, that states couldn't disrupt their Title II approach. And in our decision, uh, following the same approach, uh, we have a federal light touch regime that can't be uh, disrupted. But that still leaves room for state attorney general actions that are consistent with our action. Uh, and we point that out. And certainly, Federal Trade Commission uh, enforcement actions as well. So there are real positive law protections in place for consumers. I, one thing to add to that uh, in terms of considering a federal uh, versus a patchwork of state regimes, you know, in a sense, I love this issue because it really goes back to the founding of the republic, uh, you know, sort of Hamilton versus Jefferson. Uh, when we think about competition, one of the things we think about is uh, our barriers to entry. Um, and regulatory compliance can be one of those barriers. So consider a startup firm trying to handle privacy, right? They collect data on folks to try to provide a better service to their customers. Um, in order to scale, in order to grow, uh, in order to provide products online where you're almost necessarily reaching folks in 50 different states, if you have to comply with a wide variety of different rules, mm -hmm. um, that's more difficult to do. Uh, maybe instead of that engineer, you're hiring a lawyer. Now, I love lawyers, and employment for lawyers is good. And we appreciate that. <laughs> uh, for lawyers. Um, but it's also important to understand that uh, to the extent firms have available to them one consistent standard, they can plan their business practices around it. So that can be a very pro-competitive thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll build on that a little bit. So during the, the Title II net neutrality debate in DC, uh, the buzzwords were really Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon. That's what you heard in the talking points. The reality is there are thousands of smaller broadband providers mm -hmm. that are serving millions and millions of consumers. Uh, those are the ones particularly serving areas that have little to no other option for broadband. They were the ones uniquely impacted by the FCC's Title II approach. Uh, we saw negative investment and in other numbers from some of the biggest providers, but they also have armies of regulatory lawyers to work through Title II and everything that comes with it. What we saw was it was those thousands of smaller providers whose names people don't use in these debates uh, that were being hurt the worst. And I spent a lot of time in my first year on the commission on the road. I've done events in 20 states meeting with a lot of those providers. They're doing real work, real hard work to deploy broadband. And they've put filings in recently showing us the increase in investment, the increase in deployment the communities that are now connected uh, because they have the incentives again to be investing and deploying. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. We were chatting out there about how uh, you have huge regulatory agencies 
that are attempting to keep pace with or at least create a framework that incents cutting edge investments and technologies that will always be ahead of where the regulatory environment is or the consumer protection environment. So how, how are you as, you, as you look at that, as you think about that, how are you balancing those competing goals? Because you really do need to, there's no doubt about the benefits of broadband, there's no doubt that there will be consumer concerns that you'll need to address. But at the same time, you need to make sure that you're not stopping the innovation and the investment that drives all these great benefits. So that question, to some extent, is to some extent answered by the DNA of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, we were conceived uh, in the teens, you know, over a hundred years ago, as an agency that the job of which was to look at what was going on in markets, mm -hmm. to understand it. We actually have special statutory authority to conduct investigations. Um, the process we're engaging in now, the hearing process, is one of taking in input from the outside. Um, and then later, with respect to consumer protection, uh, in the 30s, we were given authority under a pretty broad statutory mandate. And the idea is this. We have the tools to look at what's going on in the market. Um, and when we hear complaints, uh, we have the ability um, and the breadth of statutory mandate to go and look at them. Um, are the practices deceptive? Are they unfair? We also have, within the structure of the agency, a really good way of dealing with these issues. Um, we have three sort of key bureaus at the FTC. We have the Bureau of Competition. That's the antitrust side of the house. We have the Bureau of Consumer Protection. That's uh, unfair and deceptive acts and practices, uh, and a host of other laws that Congress has charged us with enforcing. And we have the Bureau of Economics. Um, so when a case comes up, when we look at conduct, um, we get the facts, we get the view of the lawyers, we also get the view of the economists. Um, and one of the things that we think about a lot um, is innovation. I also believe that the structure that we have of being able to look outside the context of enforcement at issues that are going on, conduct in the market, and also having in particular cases to look at the facts at hand, not just a broad picture um, of what someone might think is going on, allows us to focus, like Commissioner Carr was saying, on where the harm is greatest to consumers. And from an FCC perspective, this balancing act, I know you've been focused on that a lot as you're trying to incent investment in yeah. the next gen. Yeah, I think you're right. This, this is an age-old uh, question of innovation uh, and how do you make sure that regulation uh, doesn't fall so far behind that it's putting the reins on innovation. And it's one that, you know, at the FCC we take seriously as well. And the key, I think, is, when, is, is to take concrete action to update and modernize your regulations as quickly as possible. I think one place you see that right now at the FCC is on this new trend towards 5G, as we talked about, which is next generation wireless service. From a network perspective, it's going to look very different than the 3G and 4G deployments of the past in this particular respect. Right now, we have about 300,000 cell sites in the country since the dawn of uh, cellular service. We need to start moving at a pace of 60,000 new cell sites a year going forward. That's a tremendously different approach than what we've done before. And these new cell sites are small cells. They can be the size of a backpack. They're not necessarily those 200-foot towers that mark 3G and 4G deployments of the past. And our regulatory approach at the federal level, and in many state and local levels, had not been updated, had simply assumed that a new cell site, whether it's a backpack on a light pole, requires the costly, lengthy regulatory review process that you would do for a new 200-foot tower. That was adding tremendous cost to deployment, threatening our country's leadership when it comes to deployment of 5G, particularly when it comes to China, and simply making it so that consumers aren't going to get that service faster. So an example of innovation in technology moving more quickly than regulation. And so we saw that at the Commission, and we've moved re relatively quickly. We, at the federal level, have excluded small cells from review procedures designed for those 200-foot towers. And just yesterday at the Commission, we took a vote that updates and modernizes the approach with respect to state 
and local review to make sure there's not outlier conduct mm -hmm. that may be appropriate for big towers but doesn't make sense for small cells. We've taken those two actions in the last six months. Roughly, uh, if you look at different economic studies and costs, that nearly cuts in half the cost of deploying a small cell. So the reason that we don't see deployments in a lot of hard to serve areas is the economics. But if you can take half of the regulatory cost, half of the total cost out of the equation, think about all of the communities that are now profitable for the private sector to serve. So that's one example where there was a challenge and I think we're meeting that challenge, mm -hmm. but it is always gonna be a challenge to make sure that we're moving quickly to update regulations in light of new innovations. So what some of the folks listening may not appreciate is this overlap as well as complement of agencies at the federal government and how they can or sometimes can work together and sometimes don't necessarily work together. And it, based on the way both of you are talking about broadband, different approaches, different roles, but, but incredibly important that there be uh, a consistent overall policy approach so that you're complementing what the other agency is doing. And if you could talk a little bit about this memorandum of understanding and how the two agencies are really reaching out more, way more than when I was there uh, to think about how you're going to create an environment that does incent the investment, does what the FCC does best, and at the same time ensures that at the back end there's someone watching out for a lot of the consumer protection issues. Yeah, I think Commissioner Phillips really laid it out uh, very clearly when he walked through the different bureaus that the FTC has, the different statutory authorities, the expertise on consumer harm, whether it's you know the narrow semiconductor industry, which is difficult and complex, or whether it's the broadband market, which is, I would assume, relatively easier task for them than some of the other uh, areas that they have focused on. Um, and again, I think if you go back to the Title II debate, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of reasonable disagreement as well. But one of the pieces of uh, misinformation out there was this idea that by pulling back on Title II utility-style regulation, as we talked about earlier, uh, there wasn't going to be a cop on the beat, that consumers were going to be left uh, to uh, have their internet experience dictated solely by their broadband the provider. World, right? And consumers didn't like that. And I get that. And that's not the world uh, that we moved into, and that's not the world we're into now. As Commissioner Phillips laid out, there are specific statutory authorities. Uh, there's consumer harm standards. Uh, and now we have two agencies working together uh, to make sure that consumers are going to be protected online, and the MOU uh, is one part of that. And as I said earlier, the, the basic structure is, um, as part of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, you have the transparency rule. Um, I think it was Justice Brandeis who said, you know, that sunlight is the best disinfected. Uh, we now have a regime where uh, companies uh, in the business uh, of providing internet service have to make public representations uh, by law um, to the public uh, about a variety of practices uh, in which they are engaged. Um, and we can judge them by those representations, and the public can do that too. Like consumer advocates, uh, consumers themselves can look and say, hey, that's not my lived experience. FTC, go take a look at that. Um, the FCC is responsible for making sure that these disclosures are made, um, and then we help on the enforcement side. So through these broadband hearings, for example, when you look ahead, you mentioned what Katowski did previously, and you look ahead to what you'd like to see accomplished over the next year. How does that fit into this big dialogue around broadband? Sure. So as I said before, one of the things that we are supposed to be doing um, as an agency is watching trends in various aspects of the market. Uh, in 2007, we put out a report uh, following our, the convening of our Internet Access Task Force. Um, I think it is reasonable, 11 years later, um, to take a look at how that market has developed. Um, it's a market that Commissioner Carr has described to you uh, as continuing to be in tremendous flux. Um, we should look at what we saw then, what we see now. 
Um, are there practices that are more common that may be concerning? Um, how prevalent are those practices? Um, what are the market checks? What are the legal checks upon those practices if they exist? Um, and so I think uh, looking at how the market has changed, looking at the facts on the ground, looking at the impact on consumers are all things that we can revisit beginning uh, with the hearings. So as the FTC is looking at these trends and gathering the data, how will that information then inform the FCC as it looks at, I mean, it's, it, as a regulatory agency, it looks at mergers, it looks at regulatory frameworks, it looks at uh, complaints from consumers. That data, that information, how will that be used at the FCC? Yeah, we have a strong partnership, obviously, uh, with the FTC on these issues, so we'll continue to be uh, partnering and taking a look at all this information. On the DOJ side as well, we have uh, obviously strong relationships there. We coordinate, whether it's in the merger context uh, or other contexts, to make sure that uh, we're coordinated with all of these agencies. So one of the questions that always comes up, and it's as someone who has seen many years before Congress engages on numerous issues because they're complex, they're controversial, and it's hard to get things done, but a uh, you, we've had a lot of conversations in the public recently about, gee, it would be great if Congress could adopt some new legislation that would clarify roles uh, between federal and state, that would have federal baseline privacy and data security laws, uh, and maybe create for a more stable regulatory environment. I know you, whether you want to or not, probably spend a decent amount of time up on the Hill <laughs> uh, talking with our elected officials. How's that dialogue going? What are you thinking? Are you, are you thinking, well, I have to work with what I've got today, but I can certainly hope for change, or do you feel like you've got the tools you need? Well, I would certainly support, uh, it's obviously up to Congress's best judgment, but would support them stepping in, uh, whether it's with uh, some standalone net neutrality legislation, because mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, the concept of net neutrality, the specific principles, there isn't a tremendous amount, from my perspective, uh, reasonable disagreement about what those basic the rules of the road should be. Again, the FCC, we face a very different question, which is most fundamentally, definitionally, is the Internet a Title II service or is it a Title I service? We answered that question. In doing that, it meant that the Title II specific rules went away. Mm -hmm. But again, that did not create a void because of our transparency rules, because of the FTC enforcement authority. And more broadly, I think Congress is doing a great job leading in the broadband space. Uh, Senator Thune, for instance, uh, who's the chair of the Commerce Committee, has put some very forward-thinking ideas out there on infrastructure reform that are part of this idea of the race to 5G, and getting more broadband deployed to more communities. Uh, we picked up on a lot of his leadership in our vote yesterday. Uh, Senator Cory Gardner has the Airwaves Act out there, which is going to make sure we have the spectrum needed to get these new technologies across the finish line. And obviously there's privacy hearings and discussions going on as well. So Congress is very engaged on this. They're leading on this and we're picking up on their ideas where it makes sense. And you've probably had more recent conversations going through the confirmation process. What are you hearing and what are they saying about the FTC and its role? Uh, yeah, let me say the following. I, I'm kind of an article one guy in this respect. Um, for the big decisions, whether it's net neutrality or privacy or data breach, Congress is the right body to do. In our mm -hmm. scheme, they are the ones with the mandate to make. They are in fact elected. <laughs> they are in fact elected. So. <laughs> uh, they are in fact elected. Um, and I think uh, they obviously have a lot of disagreements on things. That's how the process works. Mm -hmm. But it's through that process of building consensus, um, figuring out the right balance, federal to state, figuring out, you know, innovation versus consumer protection, what have you. Um, they are the right body to do it. Um, and there are very active conversations, as we read in the paper, every day going on. Um, in particular, lately on privacy, uh, mm -hmm. certainly for a while on net neutrality. Uh, the data breach legislation question is, I believe, older than a decade. Yeah. Um, as a commission on a bipartisan basis, although, uh, you know, we've called for a federal bill. Uh, I think that would be a good idea. Uh, I'll pick on one particular issue. Uh, Commissioner Carr was talking earlier about the uh, 
a common carrier exception in our statute. That dates back to the days of the ICC, yes, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Yes, it does. Uh, we were created and they were the other agency and that's what they had. Um, doesn't really make sense today. Uh, so that's something Congress could probably deal with, uh, which I would like to see. Um, but no, uh, I think uh, there are a lot of important conversations going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, for a lot of these things, Congress really does have to lead it. With respect to the role of the FTC, <coughs> bless you. Excuse me, sorry. Um, okay. What I am pleased to hear, I think on a bipartisan basis, and I was pleased to see, uh, I think, reflected uh, in the principles on privacy that were put out the other day by NTIA, um, a recognition of the FTC's historic role and expertise on privacy issues. That's a space in which we've been involved for a while. We have given a lot of thought to it. We continue to give a lot of thought to it every day. And are we at this pivot moment where the benefits of the internet, of the data, of the access that we have to this wealth of information has fundamentally changed the way we look and think about privacy? Because I have appreciated that certainly my daughter, who's 22, looks at privacy in a very different way than I do and in a very different way than her grandfather. So with every advancement, you know, there are societal puts and takes for benefits associated with moving into a city and having a manufacturing economy versus a rural economy. Is privacy one of those debates that we're just grappling with and trying to figure out how does that intersect with 5G and what it can do and not do? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think particularly over the last couple... And, that, and I didn't prep you on this one because I just thought of it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I think particularly over the last couple of years, you know, privacy has really come to the forefront uh, in a lot of these public debates. Uh, the FCC looked at privacy with respect to broadband providers only a couple of years ago, and the underlying uh, premise of the FCC's approach back then was that there is some uh, exceptional amount of data that broadband providers have versus, say, edge providers or mm -hmm. other actors in the Internet space, such that there needs to be uh, a, an unlevel field in the sense of unique regulation on broadband providers, uh, but not parity on the edge provider side. I think our experience... And so, just for folks listening, so edge providers are simply non-common non -common carriers sure. who have a lot of data. Yeah. And I think the last two years in particular have really showed how misguided that prior FCC approach is. That as a consumer, you don't necessarily care whether it's your broadband provider has the data or your edge provider has the data, you want a standard that applies to make sure that there's adequate disclosures and adequate protections. I think we've also seen, again, this idea underlying the prior FCC's approach about some unique insight to data on the ISP side versus the edge provider side. I think, again, that is a fundamental premise that, under, uh, that, that, that was at the core of the prior FCC's approach that's been disproven. Uh, over the last couple of years with uh, additional disclosures about uh, data and use of data across the internet ecosystem. And so now we'll pivot over to the FTC because you've been in the privacy world, but this brings a whole new level of privacy challenges and analysis and understanding that impacts both consumers and the companies that are engaged in the broadband space. So what, yeah, you've been there all of, you know, four or five months now. Has it figured so it out, yeah. tell me how you're going to fix this <laughs> and, and figure it out. The same way I fix everything with duct tape. <laughs> and um, a stick. <laughs> uh, let me say a couple things. Um, the first is there are a host of statutes on privacy currently on the books, a number of which we have enforced for decades. Uh, FICRA involving the credit bureaus, uh, COPPA, involving children's online privacy protection. Um, these are statutes, um, and, and they're not the only statutes uh, that we have enforced, um, and they have a real role to play in our economy. What they reflect thus far is the judgment by Congress that there are certain areas um, of particular concern. Uh, part of what animated FICRA was the fact that 
in the main, the consumer, uh, rather the credit bureaus, collect information about folks with whom they don't have privity. Right? So they're not talking to you, they're talking to your car dealer or your bank or what have you. Um, COPPA involves kids. Uh, the law treats kids differently, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, you were talking about how different people view privacy. Uh, I will admit the following. I was practicing a speech on privacy a few months ago in front of my wife, and my seven-year-old <laughs> and my three-year-old heard me saying privacy and started marching around the room talking about the potty. And my seven-year-old, <laughs> this is a true story, promptly ran out, um, got a piece of paper, drew a toilet, wrote, such as she writes, privacy on it. Um, that's one view of privacy. <laughs> uh, it actually resonates pretty well with most of us. We all associate mm -hmm. that with privacy. Um, so we have targeted, Congress has targeted particular areas uh, of particular concern um, in privacy based on our national view that there is heightened risk. Um, there are a lot of new concerns. Um, there are a lot more uh, edge providers and others with a lot more data. Uh, I think that's part of why we're seeing a national conversation, really an international conversation, we are. very we much are. an international conversation. Uh, are we at a tipping point? It's hard to say. That's going to be uh, a question highly dependent on a variety of factors. One of the things that I have said publicly um, is that as we consider national legislation, uh, we do need to keep innovation in mind. And we do need to consider the fact that under certain circumstances, uh, more rules can benefit incumbents um, and prevent startups from entering a market. Uh, and that has implications for the competition side. Absolutely does. And it's a, it's a constant tension, I think, yes, that, you, that both agencies face. So now I'm going to do a unique question for Commissioner Carr and then another for you. And Commissioner Carr, this goes to everything that you briefly touched on in your opening remarks about how ubiquitous infrastructure is going to be essential. You had a, a, an auction for service to rural markets recently. There's still a lot that are unserved, and I know that you're passionate about figuring out a way to get service to them. You want to talk a little bit about why you're passionate about it and what you're trying to do, not just to remove barriers, but to create some sort of a framework that will have incentives for companies to go out and serve some of these less dense markets, geographically challenged markets. Yeah. Well, I'll pick up on the, the infrastructure portion of that in particular, because I think this ties back to what I've, I've touched on a couple of times in the 5G space. When you think about the transition from 3G to 4G and what it did for our economy and for our own lives, uh, it's amazing when you look back. Eight to 10 years ago, when we were on that cusp of the transition to 4G, uh, we didn't have the app economy and the tremendous innovation that came over these 4G networks. And we look forward at the transition to 5G, it's going to be a bigger deal than that transition to the app economy from 3G to 4G. The Wall Street Journal has looked at this a lot. They did an editorial earlier this week. I saw that. They've done some reporting in the, the past weeks as well. They've described this move to 5G as transformative, not just from a technology perspective, but from an economic perspective as well. Deloitte has a study out there that shows that the country that's first to 5G can sustain an economic advantage for a decade. So those are the stakes that are out there, and the challenge to your question is an infrastructure one. One of our biggest competitors is China. They view this shift from 4G to 5G as their opportunity to dislodge the United States in terms of our leadership uh, in the tech space. And which leadership government dollars. Right, which the leadership we established by winning the race to 4G. So how do we win the race to 5G? Well, as we talked about, it's all about infrastructure. It's all about densifying our networks with more cell sites. As I mentioned, we have about 300,000 cell sites in the country now. China has about one, I'm going to get the number wrong, on a per capita basa, basis, which is more favorable to us, they have three times the number of cell sites as we do in the U.S. And if you look back since 2015, they've been moving aggressively in this space. So that gives them essentially a, a, a head start on standards, equipment, all the things that we've always, that the U.S. has always been a leader. Yeah, first mover advantage is tremendous. They've started out in this race to 5G with essentially 
uh, a three times head start, three times advantage in the infrastructure space. And so we'll take this seriously at the commission and we're working to close that gap. And that's really what our decision was about yesterday. So how do we update our approach to close that infrastructure gap with China? So we can see more infrastructure deployed, not just to win the race to 5G, but to your point, how do we make sure that every single community benefits from the economic opportunity of 5G? New York's going to see it. San Francisco is going to see it just because they're big, must-serve cities. But regulatory reform, it flips the business case in those edge communities. That's what, that's what it's all about. How do you take the cost down so that this community that was unprofitable to go into, well, we've now reduced the regulatory cost. That then creates the incentive uh, for the private sector to go in there and deploy. Thank you. That's great. Um, and it's a very important challenge, and I'm really glad you're, you guys are spending so much time and energy on it. From an FTC perspective, we've been talking a lot about it be enforcement being a central part of the FTC's work. But for a lot of us who haven't lived and breathed in that space, how does an investigation get started? Uh, what tools do you have when you, when you start doing? So I know you're doing these hearings, but aside from hearings, on the day-to-day, -day, what are the tools you have and when do you decide to investigate? And you described the various agencies, but there's a lot going on out there. How do you pick and choose your, your highest and best use of your resources? Sure. Um, the, as a law enforcement agency, we are eyes wide open, um, ear to the ground. We have a variety of ways that we get um, cases brought to us. Consumer complaints are a really good example of those. Makes sense. Um, we have uh, something called the Sentinel Network, um, which is an incredibly sophisticated mechanism for gathering complaints. Uh, consumers out there who are experiencing complaints can go to our website, um, and we monitor that. Uh, we look at what people are complaining about, um, how often they're complaining, that sort of thing. Uh, consumer advocates come in and talk to us, members of Congress, other agencies. Uh, there are all sorts of ways uh, that we spot things. In terms of what we target, um, there are a lot of different inputs to that too. So one really important one is congressional mandate. You know, if Congress wants well, us to look at- That makes sense. <laughs> if Congress wants us to look at uh, cases involving the privacy of children, that's our job, right. uh, faithfully to execute the law. Um, another thing is that we do look, as I was saying before, for new trends in the market. We look to make an impact. A practice is bad. Um, the harms outweigh the costs. Uh, we want to go in there and help send a signal to the market that you shouldn't be doing this. Um, that, again, part of our congressional mandate. Um, as Commissioner Carr was saying earlier, we also look at consumer harm, you know, the cases that make the biggest impact. Um, uh, this gets less fanfare uh, relative to some of the really hot topics of the day, um, but business opportunity cases. So you all are probably watching television at night or on the internet and you see ads for, this is a way that you can make $10,000 a week you know, all year. Um, some of those claims, at least, are not true. Um, and I'm people shocked. invest a <laughs> tremendous amount of money of their no, personal very, fortune very. Um, mm -hmm. trying to better their lives, right? They think they're starting a business. Um, they're being defrauded. Um, and sometimes uh, criminal authorities are there. Um, we want to be there, too. So we also look for those cases, even the ones that don't get a lot of fanfare, even the ones that don't get the most focus. Um, and our lawyers work day and night um, to try to bring justice to the bad people um, and, where appropriate, to disgorge their gains and put them back with consumers. That's great. Well, I can't thank both of you enough because we're fortunate as a country to have you guys there doing what you're doing to uh, improve the lives of consumers and to balance all of these very thorny competing issues. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you to WLF. Should I ask if there are any questions from the audience? I can't win.
Thank you. Um, Margaret McGill with Politico. I did have a question for Commissioner Carr. It's kind of related to the state federal law on um, net neutrality. I'm curious what you think the role of the FCC would be if California does go ahead and um, that net neutrality law takes effect. What would the FCC be in any court challenge? Yeah, I defer to the Chairman's Office and the Office of General Counsel uh, on the direction of that. And I assume it would also be the DOJ that would be involved in terms of whether there's a lawsuit brought or not. Presumably that would be the lead uh, agency in that. Uh, and I, I technically I don't recall legally what the FCC's role is uh, exactly if there is a lawsuit or not. If it's DOJ and we're there, if it's purely DOJ, uh, I haven't thought through that. And I think it becomes it's the end of this weekend that uh, it would become law if nothing happens and then it doesn't even get implemented for a couple of years if I you know there's like there's a process so I don't think anything happens immediately but it starts a process yeah and I don't have any insight either whether there is or or isn't going to be one either this question from an online viewer uh, antitrust and consumer protection investigations often take a while given the lengthy probes how can FTC stop net neutrality violations? Let me say the following. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have the ability as an agency to go after conduct that violates either the antitrust laws uh, or our consumer protection laws. Um, where we see conduct that violates those laws, we go after that conduct. You know, I'll simply add as well that I think part of this uh, gets this, this idea, I guess there's two responses to this. The FCC's Title II approach had a legal standard, and then if there was a violation of that legal standard, again, legal standards aren't self-enforcing, uh, there was enforcement action. And now we have a regime in which uh, if there's a violation, whether it's of our transparency standard or Federal Trade Commission law, antitrust law, there will then be enforcement action taken against that standard. So we are in the same situation of a standard and needing to take enforcement action, whether it was the FCC's regime or the FTC's regime. And in fact, consumers actually are enjoying, in one respect, in many respects, uh, this new regime. And part of that is if you look back at the FCC's Title II approach, the DC Circuit in upholding it said that the FCC's Title II rules did not handcuff broadband providers and prevent them from doing a lot of the conduct, whether it's blocking or throttling. What the DC Circuit said was that the FCC's regime was simply a disclosure regime. That's how they read the FCC's approach in upholding it on appeal. So they said, if a broadband provider were to disclose, I'm going to block, I'm going to throttle, I'm going to discriminate. The DC Circuit, reading the FCC's rules, and said the FCC's title rules allowed that allowed blocking, allowed throttling, allowed discrimination, as long as the broadband provider disclosed it. Now we have a regime in which you can disclose something, but if it's a violation of FTC law or antitrust law, uh, that's not necessarily a get out of jail free card. So there are strong consumer protection 